was frantically whisper shouting, stop it, stop it. You do not have the baby. I have the babies. Wake up, wake up, get the babies. That is not a baby. Welcome to Book Therapy. I'm your host, Kim Patton. There's no way to count how many books are floating around in this world. Some are decent, some are truly terrible, and some are great. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into one great book. Together, we will discover gems of truth and encouragement to help you face your current season of life. I'm ready. You're ready. Let's get this party started. Hello, hello. Before we dive into the book, I just wanted to let you know that if you are a mama in the early years of raising kids, I do write for Hervey from Home. It's an online community that centers around women and motherhood and all of the stories on there are true and just cut right to the heart of the season that you're in. If you go to my website, kimpatton.com and click on her view from home stories, there are a few that I've written about having a difficult child, loving our children, and dealing with overstimulation in the everyday life, things like that. So if you're interested, check it out. Hopefully, Hopefully those stories can encourage you where you are right now. Let's dive into today's book. We are talking about Loving the Little Years, Motherhood in the Trenches by Rachel Jankovic. While this book focuses on motherhood and the little years, I am going to broaden it a little bit to include just going through hard seasons. We'll talk about some specifics regarding motherhood and raising children, but the general principles cover everything from how to love well to how to see the best in people and just practice gratitude and managing intensity in emotional moments. This book is definitely helpful for everyone. The author, Rachel Jankovic, lives with her husband and she is pregnant with her eighth child. She just graduated her oldest, so she has an 18-year-old. And she's about to give birth to a brand new baby. So she has a unique family and a unique set of circumstances and a unique calling. She authors books. She writes online. At the heart of it, she teaches the gospel. And that's what I'm looking for in my life. So just to set the scene of where she's at when she wrote this book, she had five kids, five and under, including one set of twins. She talks about how difficult physically, emotionally this season was for her. She says on page 40, I can remember around this time taking the garbage out and just standing outside the door taking some deep breaths ready to go back in. When taking the garbage out becomes a destination, you know you're really in the trenches. I think you can relate to this as I can whenever we're in those overwhelming moments where we step outside or we have to go to the stairs at our workplace. I used to do that. I used to run away to the stairs and just sit down and take a few deep breaths and think about, holy cow, what am I doing? (laughs) What am I in for? This long haul is tough and I'm struggling. And before I am brave enough to go back to my cubicle, I just need to sit here for a minute. It could be anything. It could be facing a tough relationship or workplace. To give a little more detail about what she was going through with the twins specifically is a really funny story of her and her husband. And this will kind of help you get to know her a little bit just because she's she tends to take moments of everyday life and add her humor to it. And it really helps make light of the situation. I find that difficult to do. I don't always want to laugh when I'm having a hard time. In fact, if someone tries to get me to laugh when I'm having a hard time, I sometimes want to punch them in the face. But Looking back, I can see how adding levity to a situation does help me get through it or does help give me perspective. So in this particular story, they are feeding the twins every night and it's a sleepless season. They're not only feeding the twins, but they're both doing it together. She's nursing them and her husband is changing diapers and burping the babies and then they get them back to sleep, or she nurses while they go back to sleep. But this one particular night, she woke up, the babies were sleeping on top of her, and she realized her husband was asleep next to her, but she couldn't get out of bed. (laughs) She couldn't get her babies back to their beds to sleep for a few more hours so that she could go back to bed. She says on page 91, I started kicking. Just a nice, quick toe punch to the shins. I wouldn't say nothing happened, but it wasn't much. After a lot of kicking and sort of sharp whispering, he sat up. 
I was relieved, but it was premature. He didn't do anything. Slowly, he got out of bed and turned to lean on it. Then, after a minute or two, he gathered himself up and headed out of the room. It takes her a minute, though, to realize, wait a minute, no, you're going to the room to go get the sleeping babies, but that's not what she needed. (laughs) She needed him to help her get the babies back to bed. So she continues on page 92. At this point, I was pretty much whisper shouting, which is hard to do. He passed by the door again, and I saw it. He was bouncing a baby, patting it on its little air back and soothing it back to sleep. He was being the most selfless and kind daddy, walking the hall in the middle of the night with his dream baby. I was frantically whisper shouting, stop it, stop it, you do not have the baby, I have the babies, wake up, wake up, get the babies, that is not a baby. (laughs) He eventually woke up, they put him to bed, they laughed about it in the morning, but this was kind of their life for a while with the twins, and they were a little bit like zombies. First things first, number one, deal with yourself first. She says on page 14, the state of your heart is the state of your home. As you deal with your children, deal with yourself always and first. This is what it looks like and feels like to walk with God as a mother. What does it look like to deal with yourself first? I can tell you many times where I'm focused on behavior of other people and not my own sin or selfishness going on. It's like the verse of the Bible where it says you point out the speck in the other person's eye. Well, you have a log in your own eye. I think that's what it is, but sometimes when we're dealing with children or people younger than us or under our authority, we tend to think that we have the authority and we are in charge. So it gives us that illusion of power when Jesus was a servant and he didn't exert his power. So why should I? I tend to lord over or have control or exert my authority flaunt my authority when really that shows my pride and my selfishness when really those are the things we're supposed to shed. Instead of throwing yourself a little pity party, which is really easy to do, think about your heart. Think about where your affections lie in the moment and your priorities and your tendencies and evaluate those to the needs of another person. With these intense moments of parenting or relationship with others, Rachel said that she noticed the super intensity would almost always be over in 20 minutes. And she says it's better to just put your head down, work through it, maintain a good attitude, and it'll all be over in a little while. I wouldn't say that every season of life is over in 20 minutes, but there are short bursts of intensity. And you can think about an example in your own life, let's say the dinner hour, where there's just a super intense section of time where pretty much nobody's happy (laughs) and everything needs to get done and nobody gets what they want immediately. This can be a stressful time. My husband actually adopted this philosophy. He told me that there are some moments with the girls where he knows the next 20 minutes are just going to suck. Whether it's a walk or a drive, he just knows, okay, in 20 minutes we'll be home or in 20 minutes the walk will be over or in 20 minutes we can eat. We can have a snack or we can have a meal. But for these next 20 minutes, we just kind of got to grit our teeth and get through it. And he's able to set aside that time and push through. I struggle with that because when I'm in the middle of tantrums and crying and screaming and whining or whatever's going on, I just feel like it's going to last forever. <laughs> and I agonize and I, and I whine about it. <laughs> I whine about the kids whining. And this is what Rachel says on page 44. Look at the clock, look at the work you need to do, and bear down. That super intensity will almost always be over in 20 minutes. Secondly, we have this magic thing called the bulk effect. I don't know if she made this up or someone else did, but it was brilliant. And I I wrote in the book, holy cow, this could change my life. You are being hit with a lot at one time, and it's really easy to just snap when really the situations can be broken down into smaller increments or smaller choices. I'll, I'll give you her example. She says that you're getting ready for to go out the door and one child is doing one thing, another child is doing another thing. You need to get someone their shoes. You need to do someone's hair. You need to get out the door. The socks and the shoes disappear and then you have your partner in the other room that you're trying to get their attention and then someone comes in and needs a diaper change and it can be a little chaotic. The problem is You have this pressure building up in you and then it's going to mount 
and you're going to feel it and you're going to burst. The bulk effect means if one child does this, another child does something else, and you're feeling this way, your partner's feeling a certain way, and then somebody says something or does something, then it's all over. But because you've allowed that pressure to build up to where you're trying to get out of the door and nothing else matters in the moment, you'll snap on someone that doesn't deserve it because it's not that individual's actions that deserved a punishment or deserved a moment of anger. It's the culmination of everybody. And so it's on me, let's say, to maintain self-control, to put everything in perspective as it's happening, to not put so much pressure on the clock or to not put so much pressure on each person involved, but instead to take things in each section as it is. As I'm trying to get both my girls out the door, it's remarkable how slow Eden can walk down the stairs (laughs) to the car. If she wants to, and I'm either holding the baby or the baby has already, you know, crawled down the stairs feet first. Sometimes she slides down like a little seal at the ocean. I would just kind of look at Eden and she's two and she's just delicately walking down the stairs, talking to me about something or just moving at glacial pace. (laughs) And I've had to laugh about it a few times because what is it really? I mean, we're going to be late to the library story time by five minutes or we're going to be late to church by 10 minutes. It's not a big deal. There's no way that a last minute diaper change or a shoe debacle should ruin the whole day. This is the stuff of this season. And so this is what I have to keep in perspective as I'm trying to get out of the door. It's not the individual who's in charge of getting us to church in time. It's me. And I can have self-control and I can have patience and I can maintain an air of respect for everyone in my household instead of rushing and hurrying and getting frustrated at the little actions of these little people. Lastly, we have vices and virtues. Everyone knows that your personality and your character is made up of a thousand little things. And there's some really big and wonderful things that are strengths for you but they also can become your weaknesses or vice versa. The key is to see people's vices and virtues and to not allow their vices to overshadow their virtues and to not allow their virtues to turn into their vices. (laughs) Is this confusing? It sounds a little confusing. Whoever is in your family, their likes and dislikes and strengths and weaknesses are now a part of your world. So when we love someone, we embrace the whole of who they are. If there's something about someone you love that drives you crazy, that is a part of your relationship with them. You can't just say this person is amazing except for this reason. These kids have potential in every little bit of their personality. So if you have someone who is a people pleaser, like one of Rachel's daughters, she just knows what people want. She can either use that talent to bless the people around her or to manipulate them. Rachel also makes this point of you don't want to discipline vices as though they are unconnected to virtues. If you are seeing a certain personality trait come out in your child and you want them to wield it for good, Try not to focus on the negative. Teach her or teach him how to turn that around for good. For instance, if you have a very chatty child who loves words and loves talking to people but can become very bossy or very critical, Rachel says, teach her how to encourage. Make her practice while you listen and encourage her with smiles, winks, or nods. Tell her how you want to hear her using her tongue to build up others. So it's cool that we have multiple sides to our character and our personality, but we do have to be careful of what we're using for good and what needs to be harnessed. So just to conclude, we talked about dealing with yourself first. The state of your heart is the state of your home. Secondly, the bulk effect and how everything can kind of build. But if we deal with things individually, we can see things with a clear perspective. And lastly, vices and virtues, just keeping in mind the strengths and weaknesses of each other. 
I like how Rachel wraps it up with encouraging Christian women to embrace their season of motherhood. She says on page 61, the Christian woman can say, I used to be so boring. Now my character has some depth, some people to love, some hardships to bear. Now I have some material to work with. I like this perspective because I can often think about my before kids identity and my after kids identity. And you can you can put anything in, you know, fill the blank who you are now compared to who you were before. How can you switch the perspective and say, hey, I have something to work with. I have some character building to do. There's some edges to smooth. I appreciate that perspective because it can be easy to desire comfort so much that you don't want change and you don't want anything to get in your way. But when we were in that comfortable place, we're not really growing. On the very last page, she was confessing about how she went to find Ecclesiastes because she knew there was something in the Bible about how life is futile and everything just repeats under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. She looks up this verse, Ecclesiastes 5.19. Everyone to whom God has given wealth and possessions and the power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. I love this verse because it focuses on toil as the gift of God. If you've had a job where you can really work hard and you can really be proud of what you've accomplished and you can come home and rest and relax and just know you're doing a good work, that is fulfilling, even if you're exhausted. (laughs) Work is tough, but work is a gift that God has given us. In the same way, she talks about how motherhood is hard work. On page 102, she says, It is repetitive and oftentimes menial. Accept it. Rejoice in it. This is your toil right here. Those are their faces. Enjoy them. The days of your life are supposed to be full of things like this. I like how she says those are their faces. Whoever's in your life, whoever you're serving, those are their faces. They are the gift. Not just having them, but rejoicing in the relationship and in the toil. I, for one, don't always rejoice in the hard work. I'm really good at complaining. But at the end of the day, I do remember their faces. And I do recognize that these are little souls. And it is a gift. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Book Therapy Podcast. Today we talked about Loving the Little Years, Motherhood in the Trenches by Rachel Jankovic. She does have other content online, so check it out if you want to learn more about her. And if you want to buy this little bitty book that is so impactful for young moms, there's a link at my website, kimpatton.com. Just click on the book title and it'll take you to Amazon for an affiliate link. All right, see you next time.